Let's bring in Jerry Chen from Greylock. Is he here? Let's bring him in. There he is. Hey, John, good to see you. Hey, congratulations on an amazing talk and thesis on the uh, Castles on the Cloud. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, well, thanks for reading. It's, um, it's always weird when we put a piece of work out in the, out of the ether, not sure what the response is, but it, it seemed to have resonated with a bunch of uh, developers, founders, and investors, and folks like yourself. So smart people seem to gravitate to it. So thank you very much. Well, one of the benefits of doing theCUBE for 11 years, Jerry, is we have videotape of many, many people talking about what the future will hold. You kind of were on this early. It wasn't called Castles in the Cloud, but you were all, I was, we had many conversations. We were kind of connecting the dots in real time, but you've been on this for a while and it's great to see the work. I really think you nailed this. I think you're absolutely on, on point here. So let's get into it. What is, uh, castles in the cloud, new research come out from Greylock that you spearheaded, uh, it's a collaborative effort, but you got data behind it. Give a quick overview of what is <coughs> castles in the cloud, the new modes of competitive advantage for companies. Yeah, it's, it's a group project that our team put together, but basically, John, the question is, how do you win in the cloud, right? Remember the conversations we had eight years ago when Amazon reInvent was, holy cow, like, can you compete with them? Like, is it winner take all, winner take most? And if it is winner take most, where are the white spaces for some startups to, to um, emerge? <clears throat> and clearly in the past eight years in the cloud, this journey, we've seen big companies, Databricks, Snowflakes, Elastic, Mongo, Data Robot. And so um, it, it spawned the question is, you know, why are the castles in the cloud, the big three cloud providers, Amazon, Google, and Azure winning? You know, what advantage do they have? And then given their modes of scale, network effects, how can you as a startup win? And so look, there are 500 plus services between all three cloud vendors, but there are like 500 plus um, startups competing against the cloud vendors. And there's like almost a hundred unicorn of private companies competing successfully against the cloud vendors, including public companies. So like Elastic, Mongo, Snowflake, you know, Databricks, not public yet, HashiCorp, not public yet. These are some examples of the names that I think are winning and, and you know, watch this space because you see more of these guys storm the castle, if you will. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that's a funny uh, metaphor because it has many different implications. One is we talk about security, the perimeter, the gates, the moats being on land, but now you're in the cloud, you have also different security paradigm. You have a different um, new kinds of services that are coming on board faster than ever before, not just from the cloud players, but from companies contributing into the ecosystem. So you have a combination of the big three making the market, the main markets. You, I think you call it 31 markets that we know of. There probably right. may be more. And then the, you have this notion of a sub market, which means that there's like, we used to call it white space back in the day. Remember, oh, how many white, where's the white space? I mean, and if you're in the cloud, there's like a zillion white spaces. So talk about this sub market dynamic between markets and, and that are being enabled by the cloud players and how these sub markets play into it. Sure, so first, the first problem was, um, what we did, we downloaded all the services from the big three clouds, right? And, and you know, what Azure calls a database or a database service, like a document DB in Amazon is like Cosmo DB in Azure. So first thing first is we had to like look at all three cloud providers and, you know, recategorize all the services, almost 500 apples, 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 number one. Number two is you looked at all these markets or sub markets and said, okay, how can we cluster these services into things that, you know, you and I can grok, right? Because what Amazon, Azure, and Google think about it is very different. And the beauty of the, the cloud is this kind of fat long tail of services for developers. So instead of like Oracle as a single database for all your needs, they're like 20 or 30 different databases from time series, um, analytic databases. We're talking to Rockset later today, right? Um, uh, document databases like Mongo, search databases like Elastic. And so what happens is there's not one giant market like databases, there's a database market and 30, 40 sub markets that serve the needs of developers. So the great news is cloud has reduced the cost and create something net new for developers. Um, also the good news is for a startup, you can find plenty of white space for solving a, a pain point very specific to a different type of uh, problem. Yeah, and then and you can sequence up the power law too. This, I love the power law metaphor, you know, it used to be a very thin neck, no, no, torso and then a long tail, but now as you're pointing out this expansion of the fat tail of services, but also there's big TAMs and markets available at the top of the power law where you see companies like Snowflake essentially take on the data warehousing market by basically sitting on Amazon <laughs> and refactoring with new services and then getting a flywheel, completely changing the economic unit economics, completely changing the consumption model, completely changing the value proposition. 
literally right, so overnight. If you, if you think it, Snowflake has created like, you know, Storm, create a hole in that moat or that castle wall uh, against Redshift, then companies like Rockset doing real-time analytics is, is rushing right behind Snowflake saying, hey, Snowflake's great for data warehouse, but it's not fast enough for real-time analytics. Let me give you something new. So to your, to your parallel argument, even the, the big guys like Snowflake have created kind of a wake behind them that created even more white space for, for guys in rock set. So that's exciting for guys like me and you. And then also as, as um, we were talking about our last uh, episode two or quarter two of our showcase um, from a VC came on, it's like the old shelfware, you didn't know if a company was successful until they had to re return the inventory. Now with cloud, you, if you're not successful, you know it right away. <laughs> It's like, it's like, there's no debate. Like, I mean, you're either winning or not. There's like, that's so instrumented. So a company can have a good, better mousetrap and win and fill the white space and then move up. It goes both ways. The, the cloud vendors, the big three, Amazon, Google, and Azure, for sure, they instrument their own class. They know, John, which ecosystem partners doing well and which ecosystems doing poorly. And they hear from the customers exactly what they want. So it goes both ways. They, they can weaponize that info just as well as use a startup to weaponize that info. And that's the big argument of dude, the, the snowflake still pays the Amazon bills. They're still there. So again, repatriation comes back. That's a big conversation that's come up. Um, what's your quick take on that? Because if you're going to have a castle in the cloud, then you're going to bring it back to land. I mean, what's that dynamic? Where do you see that competing? Because on one hand it's innovation, the other one's maybe cost efficiency. Is that a growth indicator, slowdown? What's your view on the, the movement from and to the cloud? I think there's probably three forces you're finding here. One is the cost advantage and the, the scale advantage of cloud. So that I think has been going for the past eight years. There's a repatriation movement for a certain subset of customers that I think for cost purposes makes sense. I think that's a, a tiny handful that believe they can actually run things better than the cloud. The third thing we're seeing around repatriation is not necessarily against cloud, but you're going to see uh, more decentralized clouds and things pushed to the edge, right? So you look at companies like Cloudflare or Fastly or a company that we're investing in, Cato Networks. All they do is focus on secure access at the edge. And so I think that's not just a repatriation of my own data center, but it's kind of a disaggregation of cloud from one giant monolithic cloud in like AWS East or like a Google region in Europe to multiple smaller clouds for governance purposes, security purposes, or latency purposes. So I'm looking at my notes here. I have to look down on the screen here for this, to read this, because it's I, I'm to cut and paste from your, your thesis on the cloud, the castle in the cloud. The, of the $38 billion invested uh, this quarter, um, uh, AI and ML number one, yep. um, analytics number two, security number three, actually security number one, but you, know, you can see the bubbles here. So all those are data problems. So I need to ask you, obviously data is hot, data as intellectual property. How do you look at that? Because we've been reporting on this and we just started the CUBE conversation around workflows as intellectual property. If you have scale and your mode is in the cloud, you could argue that data and the workflows around those data streams is intellectual property. It's a protocol. A yeah, I, I, I believe both are, and they just, you kind of, they go, hand in hand, like peanut butter and jelly, right? So data for sure is IP. So if, um, you know, the people talk about data and the oil, the new resource, that's largely true um, because it powers a bunch, but the workflow to your point, John, is sticky because every company is a unique snowflake, right? Like the process you use to run the cube and your business is different how we run our business. So if you can build a workflow that leverages the data, that's super sticky. So in terms of um, switching costs, if my workflow is very bespoke to your business, then I think that's a competitive advantage. Well, certainly your workflow is a lot different than theCUBE. You guys are investing a lot of billions of dollars in capital. Uh, we're talking to all the people out here. Jerry, great to have you on. Final thought on your thesis. Where does it go from here? What's been the reaction? Uh, I know you put it out there. Great, love the research. I think you're on, on point on this one. Where, did, where does it go from here? Uh, we have two follow-up pieces um, in the near term, one around you know, a deep dive around open source. So look out for that pretty soon and how that's been a, a powerful strategy. A second is this kind of disaggregation of the cloud, be it blockchain and, and you know, decentralized apps, be it edge applications. So that's in the near term, two more pieces of, of deep dive we're doing. And then the goal here is to update this on a quarterly or annual basis. So we're getting submissions from founders that want to say, hey, you missed us or you screwed up here. We got the big cloud vendor saying, hey, Jerry, we just lost this new thing. So our goal here is to update this every single year and then probably do a look back saying, okay, uh, where were we wrong, where were we right? And then 
let's say the Castle and Clouds 2022, we'll see the difference. Where, where are the more unicorns? Where are the more services? Yeah. Where are the IPOs happening? So look for some short-term work from us on um, analytics, like around open source and, and clouds. And then next year, we hope to roll this forward saying, hey, year after year, what's happening? What's changing? Great stuff, and, and congratulations. I just saw the news. You guys put another half a billion dollars into early, early stage, which is your roots, and you're still doing a lot of great investments and got a lot of unicorns. Congratulations at Greylock and the team. Thanks for coming on, and congratulations. You nailed this one. I think we're going to look back and say that this is a pretty seminal piece of work here. Thanks for, for sharing. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me as always. Okay.